Well, if you would, grab your Bible and open it to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1, which is where we'll be spending our time this evening. Thank you, Stephen. My pleasure. Would you like me to move anything else while I'm up? <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. Habakkuk chapter 1. As we continue our study in the Minor Prophets, moving chronologically now, entering into the 600s B.C., just before the exile of the southern kingdom, Judah, by the nation of Babylon. Habakkuk, writing a short and infinitely profound book. I'm going to read for us chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2, verse 5, which is what we'll be studying this evening. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you won't hear? Or cry to you violence and you won't save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like eagles, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand, and at kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep Sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Are you not from everlasting? O Lord my God, my Holy One, who shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong... Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them all up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net. And makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I'll take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It won't lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death. He has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So reads the word of the living God.
What's the point of the book of Revelation? Is it just there because biblical scholars need a job and everyone's got to have a different view and we like to debate about these things? What's it doing there in your Bible? What's the point? Remember, it was written by John, the Apostle John, while he was exiled on the island of Patmos during the Diocletian persecution of Christians. And it was written to churches who were enduring persecution. Christians who were surrounded by wickedness. So what's the point? Well, he says it over and over and over again. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Or chapter 2, verse 25, only hold fast what you have until I come. Or chapter 3, verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. You say, well, sure, that's what he wrote to the churches, but then there's all that weird stuff about the beast and the dragon. Surely that can't be about the same thing, oh, can't it? (laughs) Chapter 13, verse 8, And all who dwell on earth will worship it, that is the beast, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who is slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Chapter 14, verse 12, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Or the very end of the book of Revelation itself, chapter 22, verse 12, behold, I am coming soon. Chapter 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. What's the point? Hold on a little longer. Just hold on a little longer. I'm coming soon. Just endure and wait. And as it turns out, that's exactly the same point that Habakkuk is making. When he says, the just shall live by faith. Notice what Revelation does not commend in the face of unbridled wickedness. He does not say, fix it, make it better, change it, revolutionize society, judge it, correct it, end it. He doesn't say any of those things. Jesus does not say that the one who changes the culture will be saved. He says in Matthew 24, verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. God's charge to believers in an increasingly wicked, depraved, anti-God world has been the same from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Revelation chapter 22. And it is perfectly summed up in this vision that we are given in 600s BC by the prophet Habakkuk. The just shall live by faith. When we are faced with injustice in the world around us, God does not demand that we enact perfect justice, only that we wait patiently for him to bring it. We walk by faith and not by sight. But another thing that Habakkuk teaches us is that while we endure and while we wait for the Lord to return and bring his justice on earth, it's still really hard. It's still hard. It's one thing to get angry when you see videos online of the latest nonsense that shows up in the world around us, isn't it? To see another video of a drag queen story hour at a kid's library. To see a video of a 13-year-old girl's right arm totally stripped bare of all flesh because it's been used for a sex reassignment surgery. To see 
another headline of school shootings, to see another rally for pro-abortion rights, as they're called. When we see wicked dictators of our world starving their own people and fattening themselves, I mean, it is right to see that and be incensed with a kind of holy ire. But it is also another thing when all of the wickedness and evil of the world comes into your home. And my guess is that some of you have felt this. We have a, a dear couple in our church um, whose eldest son currently goes by a, a female name, uh, would call himself a woman, has left the house, won't talk to his parents, except every six to ten months he'll call when he loses his job and is out on the street homeless and strung out on heroin. When that kind of wickedness comes into your life, what do you do? How do you react to that manner of evil? I mean, it makes you want to do something, doesn't it? <laughs> it makes you want to, like, fix it, like, turn the ship around, like, lobby, vote, or, so I mean, something, right? And yet, what we hear in the apocalypse of John, what we hear from Jesus on the Mount Olivet, what we hear from righteous Job, and what we hear from Habakkuk the prophet, is another path forward into dark, turbulent seas. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk prophesied after the fall of Israel, the northern kingdom. A number of the prophets that we've been looking at have been prophesying to the northern kingdom, Israel and the ten tribes there. So they're gone. Assyria came, wiped them out. Now we're in the 600s BC, and it's just the southern kingdom, Judah, which is uh, Judah and, and Benjamin, really. Jerusalem, where the heart of the kingdom is. And he's prophesying during Jehoiakim's 11-year reign of wickedness. This is following, if you know 2 Kings, Josiah, righteous Josiah, who found the book of the law and enacted a number of reforms within Judah. He had three sons, and one of his sons, Jehoiakim, ascends to the throne after his other son is taken away by the Egyptians. And he does just the opposite of his father. Habakkuk is a contemporary with Jeremiah, and Jeremiah, helpfully, gives us a little bit of a glimpse into what was so awful about Jehoiakim's reign. He says this in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13, "'Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness, and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbors serve him for nothing, and does not give him wages, who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows for it, paneling it with cedar, and painting it with vermilion.'" Do you think you're a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Is not that to know me, declares the Lord? But you have eyes and heart only for your dishonest gain, for shedding innocent blood, and for practicing oppression and violence. That's the reign of Jehoiakim. Rampant idolatry, oppression, wickedness. You remember Jehoiakim was also the king who, when he got Jeremiah's prophecy, cut it up and threw it into the fire. So it tells you how he feels about God's word. During his day, they worshipped Asherah poles, which really is kind of like their version of pornography. They burned their children as sacrifices to Molech, which is not that much unlike abortion in our day. They accumulated countless other idols that they hoped would bring them satisfaction. Jeremiah eleven thirteen tells us that they had as many gods or idols as there were cities. As many offerings to Baal as there were streets. Habakkuk was surrounded by wickedness. Just like Noah. Just like Abraham. Just like us. 
And what's unique about the book of Habakkuk is that it not only contains a prophecy about what God's going to do because of the wickedness that he finds in the world, but it also contains a kind of conversation between the prophet and God. The complaint of the prophet, really two complaints, and God's prophecy about what he's going to do about it. And because of that, I think Habakkuk then becomes for us a kind of model of a godly response in the face of injustice. In a world where wickedness reigns, where evil and sin carry the day, how ought we to respond? When it comes into your home, when it's on the news, how should we respond? I think Habakkuk gives us a good template. What do we do when wickedness prevails? And basically, we do two things, and that's going to be our outline. The first thing that you do is that you pray for God's justice. You pray for God's justice. And that's going to be basically the whole first chapter. Look at chapter 1, verse 2. Habakkuk begins his prayer to the Lord. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you won't save? This is a kind of desperate plea to God. He's obviously been at this for a while. It seems like ages that he's been praying and seeking God's intervention, laying before him the evil that he sees. He quotes Job chapter 19 verse 7, crying violence and he won't save. He says, how long will I cry for help and you won't hear? Which should provoke a question in your mind, does God hear? Well, Psalm 34, verse 15 seems to indicate, yes, God hears the prayers of the righteous. (laughs) He does. He listens. And yet, Habakkuk, like David in several psalms, says that his experience of continued prayer without seeing any obvious answer feels like he is praying to clouds of brass. He cannot get through. It's it's like God isn't listening. That's what it feels like to him. It's an honest pouring out of his soul. And so he says in verse 3, why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? I think the implication of this verse is that, well, God, you know everything and you do see this, so why aren't you doing anything? And these words that he uses here are are really important to Habakkuk. He uses them over and over and over again, particularly together. The word see and the word look. Particularly the word look, it's translated here idly look, which I think is a good translation. It, It means to look at something and do nothing. Which can, in certain circumstances, have the kind of implication to look at something approvingly. Think like... Kids are at recess, and one kid starts bullying another kid, and so you go, and you run to the teacher on the playground. Hey, there's a kid bullying another kid over there. you got to stop it. And the teacher's like, okay, and keeps scrolling on their phone. Like, that's the sense. It's like you're doing nothing. You, You know what's happening, but the fact that you're doing nothing, it's almost like you're saying, that's good. Like, keep bullying. Keep going. Like you're approving of violence and injustice. How could that be? He says, destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. I mean, it's just everywhere, all around me. Such that the law, God's law, is paralyzed. It's frozen. It's, it's useless. It's not doing anything. Remember the plumb line that Amos held in the middle of God's people? It's like crooked all of a sudden. It's not doing anything. The justice never goes forth. It's like you're never doing anything to bring justice, even as the God of justice. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. They, they have their own version of justice, and they bring it out, and it's totally crooked. And so God, hearing this longing and pleading for justice to prevail, answers And says what he's going to do to Judah with wicked Babylon. Look at verse 5. This is God's response to Habakkuk. Look among the nations and see. Those are the same words that he's used before. He's saying, 
You think I don't look? How about you look? But don't look just right around you. Look and see among the nations. Wonder and be astounded. He's like, you think I'm playing checkers. Man, I'm playing chess. I got a whole nother game going here that you don't even know about among the nations. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. All of these verbs that he's using in this sentence now are second person plural, which means he's addressing not just Habakkuk, he's addressing all of Judah. He wants all of them to hear this. I am doing something that all of you aren't going to believe. He says, I'm doing it in your days. That seems to indicate that it's going to happen in their lifetime. And the fact that he says that they won't believe it means this just isn't going to make sense to you. You would have done this differently. When you were crying for justice, you had a plan in mind. It wasn't my plan. I had a very different one. (laughs) Such that when I tell it to you, you're going to be like, no, there's no way. It couldn't work out. There's no way God could do that and still bring justice. There's no way. And then he says, verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. The Chaldeans is just another word for the Babylonians. God, being sovereign over the rise and fall of nations, has appointed Babylon as his instrument of divine retribution against wicked Judah. What does it mean that he's raising them up? Well, it means that even before Habakkuk started praying, God brought into the world a guy named Nabopolassar who would take control of this Neo-Babylonian cohort and start raising up an army to attack the Assyrians. And in 612 BC, he would overthrow Nineveh and become the major world power. In 605 BC, he would overthrow Egypt, the only competitor left at Carchemish, and he would destroy all of his competitors, continuing devouring nations left and right. And eventually his son, Nebuchadnezzar, would be the one who would invade Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, you know him from the book of Daniel, the king of Babylon, was the one who would be God's rod of divine justice against the wickedness of Judah. This evil, pagan, idol-worshipping king would be the one that God would bring to destroy evil Judah. 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah, kills Jehoiakim, takes all the high-ranking officials with him, to include Daniel, 597 B.C., he returns, he takes more exiles, probably Ezekiel with him, and then 587 B.C., he returns again and destroys the temple and takes even more exiles, and the whole land is decimated. And we won't walk through the whole description here that you see, this kind of poetic description of the fierceness and the destructive might of the people of Babylon and their army. Suffice it to say, they are a brutal, ruthless army. They are terrible in power. They are unstoppable in the ancient world. And he says, verse 11, they are guilty men whose own might is their God. They are not like fighting for the Lord, right? (laughs) They're fighting for themselves. They don't have any idea that God is using them to judge his own people They think they're just really strong. And yet, God claims sovereignty over this whole thing. He says this is his plan from the beginning. Absolutely wicked, idolatrous, barbaric, immoral Babylon destroys evil Judah. And God claims credit for the whole thing. That's what he says. He says, verse 5, I am doing a work. I am raising up. Habakkuk gets his answer, but it is not the answer that he wanted, is it? (laughs) He's like, I mean, I wanted justice, but not like that kind. And so he goes right back to the throne of grace. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? Habakkuk here, at a loss, just prays back to God his attributes, which is a really good thing to do if you're ever at a loss, is just to remind yourself by praying to God, God, you are eternal. You are holy. And I think uh, this translation says, we shall not die. I I think probably the NIV and the CSB are are correct in this. You shall not die. It's saying to God, you're eternal. You're self-existent. 
And he says, God, I, I admit that, that you're in charge of this whole thing. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, meaning Babylon. And you, O oh rock, have established them for reproof. God, I grant that this is your plan, that this is what you're going to do. And that you are entirely different from Babylon and its gods, which are man-made. But, he says, verse 13, I still got a problem with this. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? I don't know actually how much more righteous Jehoiakim and his cohort were than Babylon at this time, but apparently they're somewhat more righteous, it seems. And, and his point is, either way, why would you use a more evil nation to judge a less evil nation? Like, wouldn't you use like a righteous person to judge the unrighteous person? That would make way more sense to me. God, aren't you the God who is so pure and so holy, you can't even look at evil? It can't abide anywhere in your presence. There's no evil that's existing in the court of heaven. And yet here you are using this just debaucherous, wicked people for your purposes. Babylon? Seriously? Babylon is so much more evil than Judah and you're not doing anything about that. How can you use such a wicked tool and then do nothing about it? And he goes on to use a kind of uh, metaphor here of a fisherman that Babylon is like this evil fisherman who drags together all the fish and all the crawling things that he can catch with his net. And then he just goes and sacrifices to his net, not recognizing God is the one who gives him anything that he gets, that his luxury doesn't come from the net. How silly would that be? It comes from the one who put the fish in the sea. Verse 17, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I mean, God, are are you going to let them go unpunished too? Two of my children were recently playing with a ball. And... One was being foolish with the ball, and so the second one took the ball, swiped it. And the first one, seeing the ball being very unjustly swiped, looked at the other one, looked at me, because it was right there. This is probably just my bad parenting. L- looked at me and looked at him, and then just slapped him right in the face. This is a big old slap. And then the second one looks at me like, you going to do something? It's like both of you were wrong. <laughs> both of you did something foolish. Both of you are not doing the right thing in this situation. So, I mean, we're getting disciplined all around. Everyone, <laughs> everyone's going to jail. That's, that's what Habakkuk is saying. Like, th- th- there needs to be a settling of accounts for everyone here. And it seems like you're not doing that. And so I'm not okay with this, God. When I look out at this world and I see not just the wickedness in front of me, but also the wickedness around this nation that apparently you're going to use to judge us, I mean, what's going to happen with that? Are you going to do something? Are you going to bring justice? I mean, I know we were wrong, but they were wronger. How could you, God? I think for us, when we see another just dismal headline, some horrific thing that happens in our world that, you know, doesn't go immediately addressed, don't we have in the same kind of impulse, like, I just got to do something. <laughs> I got to bring justice to this situation. Usually it comes in the form of you posting on social media, doesn't it? <laughs> I've got a view. And everyone needs to know it. This is wrong. Which, I mean, there's a place for that. I understand. But I think Habakkuk is such a helpful model for us here. That rather than trying to solve the problem himself, he avails himself to the only one who can bring justice. 
he goes to the throne of the God who is just. He prays. Only God. Only God. Essentially, what Habakkuk is wrestling with here through prayer is what has usually been called the problem of evil. Or you might have heard it called a theodicy. If God is all-powerful, meaning what we see in His doing a work, His having ordained them, if God is all-powerful and He is all-good, He says, you're of pure eyes then to look at evil, then how is it that evil can still exist in the world? If He's all-powerful and all-good, why is there still evil? That's the problem of evil question that people have been debating for millennia, truly. And there's lots of different ways of responding to that and lots of different kinds of answers. And Habakkuk doesn't give all of them. But I want you to appreciate that Habakkuk at least goes to the right place to get his answer. He doesn't just go to another philosopher. He doesn't just ask his friend who always tells him what he wants to hear. He doesn't just read another random book and try to figure it out himself. No, he goes straight to God. He doesn't go to Egypt. He doesn't just ignore it. He goes to the judge. And this is what believers have always done in the face of inexplicable evil, is they pray. Job, afflicted as he was, in chapter 16, verse 20, says that he pours out his tears to God. He's bringing his case before God. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, he says, When the wicked are prospering, he complains to God. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, the saints who have been martyred are around the throne, and they are praying to the one who sits on the throne, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? That is what believers have always done in the face of injustice. And in the face of wickedness in the world is they pray. Brothers and sisters, if you are wearied by the evil that you see in the world around you or maybe in your own life, then pray. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Go before the throne of grace. Ask God for mercy. Don't let the news become a source of despair. Turn each headline into prayer. And do it precisely because God is in control and because He is good. One of my favorite hymns. Be still, my soul. Your God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. There's only one who is in charge of the wind and waves. And so there's only one to whom we bring our complaint. It's the Lord. But what do we do after we pray? You say, that's fine and good. I'm doing it. I'm praying. I'm on my knees. I'm asking God. I know there's a lot of evil in America. I know there's a lot of evil around the world. I'm praying, God, have mercy. Now what do I do? Here's the second answer. You ready for it? You pray for God's justice, and then you wait. You wait for God's justice. Having appealed his case to the throne of grace, Habakkuk now assumes the posture that should always follow prayer. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. He's like, I'm a watchman standing on the wall, looking out on the horizon for a runner to come, telling me of news of the battle. That's the image that he's conjuring up. It's similar to Isaiah chapter 21, 
Habakkuk stands with eager anticipation, waiting to see how God will respond and then how he will report. In verse 2, God tells him his response. And again, it's not what he expects. The Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. Meaning, like big old letters. (laughs) Put it like on a billboard so that the guy who has to go report the thing can't miss it. It's bright as day. It's right there. He sees it. He's off. He's able to report it right away. For still the vision, verse 3, awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then here is the vision. This is, this is the answer that God gives to his prophet. Verse 4. Behold, his soul, I think speaking of Babylon, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. The message that he gives to his prophet, who is waiting to hear what God will say, is essentially keep waiting. (laughs) Keep waiting. It's a contrast between two ways of thinking about the world. One way is a me-centered approach to the world, one that's puffed up, one that's self-centered, one that's not upright, one that's looking at my own hands and saying, this is where the strength is, this is where the power is, here's how we're going to get justice, is by me and my efforts and my doing. And then there's a totally opposite paradigm that is the attitude of a believer, The righteous, the one who has been declared righteous and who lives righteously, shall live by faith. How is it that you're going to endure? How is it that you're going to make it to the end? He says you do it by believing, by believing the promise that God made, by continuing to wait and to wait with faith. This in some ways, is the ultimate defining question for all of mankind. Who brings justice? Is it us? Or is it him? If it's us, then we're puffed up. If it's him, then we don't live by doing. We live by faith. That's why this is what... Paul uses this for in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, then also in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. He says, this is the exact same way that justification works. Justification is the same exact thing. You don't work for your righteousness before God, do you? No, you just receive it. You have an empty-handed, trusting, needy kind of disposition before God. It is God who does it all. He sends Christ. He dies on the cross. He gives his righteousness. You don't do anything. The main thing that Habakkuk wants us to hear here is that faith waits. If you believe in God and he has made a promise and you're believing in that promise, which is what faith is, then you will wait for it to happen. Faith is empty-handed and full of God. In contrast, he says, the Babylonians' hands are full of money. Verse 5, he says, moreover, my translation says wine, but you probably notice there's a little, if you have the ESV, there's a footnote. It says wealth. I think wealth is probably a better translation. Moreover, wealth is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest, meaning the Babylonians are just doing this because they want money. They're just motivated by the love of money like everyone else. You remember what Jesus, or I'm sorry, what Luke says about the Pharisees? Luke chapter 18. All these really religious types, or you think that they're just motivated by their religiosity? He says, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, just like everyone else, they just want world power. That's what money is. It's the ability to do stuff horizontally, isn't it? That's the Babylonians. They're just conquering more and more so that they can get more and more, but he says... The arrogant man, he's never at rest. He keeps trying to get more and more and more, and he never has enough. And then eventually, 
He dies. His greed is wide as Sheol, like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all nations, or uh, collects as his own all peoples. But then all these, the peoples that he collects, take up for his taunt against him with scoffing and riddles. And then woe after woe after woe, God says, Babylon's going to get it too. So don't you worry, Habakkuk. Judgment's coming for them. And it's exactly what they deserve. He says they make idols that are powerless. They're going to be powerless. They make other people drink. They're going to have to drink. Justice is coming to them. The Medes eventually are going to be the ones who destroy Babylon. But the contrast here is for us. Once we have prayed, he says we wait. Faith waits. Faith entrusts the future to God. To his means, to his timing. Faith says that God will bring justice in his way. Look at verse 3. Kind of skipped over it intentionally. He says, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It waits. It's not happening yet. It hasn't come. I've told you that it's going to. But all you have right now is my word. You haven't seen it fulfilled yet. It still awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It won't lie. It's going to happen. God is true. Let every man be a liar. It's definitely going to happen. And then he says this. If it seems slow, wait for it. Have you ever had that feeling? It seems slow. (laughs) Like, oh, Lord Jesus, just come now. It has been so long. I have labored for so many years with this illness. I have struggled for so long with these rebellious kids. I have been in a hard marriage for years and years and years and years. It seems so slow, the fulfillment of your promise sometimes, doesn't it? So what does he say to do? Speed it up? Wait for it. Wait for it. This is the disposition of saints all throughout the New Testament, eagerly anticipating the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, eagerly awaiting the day. Wait for it. This is the same verb that we find in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, Psalm 33, verse 20, Isaiah 8, 17, and over and over and over again. This is a word that means arresting, trusting, resigned faith and waiting for God. I believe that what you say will come true, even though I cannot see it with my eyes. This is exactly the kind of faith that Abraham had when he left out from Ur, and he could not see the promised land, and yet he believed that his God was building for him a city whose foundation is God himself. He knew that God would make good on that promise, and he never saw it in his lifetime. That's what this waiting is. That's what the faith is that the righteous have that leads to life. And it is the kind of faith that echoes in chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Or chapter 3. Verse 16, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Though all around my soul gives way. He says, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He waits, and he waits with faith. And sometimes waiting is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? (laughs) Just doing nothing. It feels interminable. And yet that's 
the call that we've been given. Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews quotes this very passage. And he says the following, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, and then he quotes it, Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And then he goes on to catalog all of those who have lived by faith in chapter 11. By faith, by faith, by faith. And the premier example, of course, is Jesus himself, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus could see to the other side of the cross. And that's what enabled him to endure it. Can you see to the other side of whatever cross the Lord has given you? Whatever evil this world would cause you to bear, can you see to the other side of it? And endure. Samuel Radagast had a friend. His name was Severus Gastonius, incredible names, who was deathly ill. And he came to his bedside, this is in the 1600s, and Gastonius asked him, would you please write a hymn for me? And so he did. While they waited and waited and waited for his death to come, he penned, whate'er my God ordains is right. Maybe a hymn you've not heard. Whate'er my God ordains is right, though now this cup I'm drinking may bitter seem to my faint heart. I take it all unshrinking. My God is true each morn anew. He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to him I leave it all. And so to him I leave it all. And in the Lord's kindness, he actually healed his friend. <laughs> he got better from his sickness and died many years later. Friend, is that your attitude towards the headlines? Like Habakkuk, that you live by faith, that you would leave it all to the Lord. Of course, there's a time and a place to speak up. Of course, there's a time and a place to stand for what's righteous. Of course, there's a time and a place for God's voice to be heard in the public square. Of course, there is. And yet, the believer's default must always be that the righteous shall live by faith. Not by doing, not by accomplishing, but by faith. Do you want to hear one more hymn story? Is that okay? I, I got like a million of them, so we can keep going. But Okay, so a guy named William Cooper, 1700s, uh, was insane. Most of his life, he struggled with insanity, like in and out of uh, insane asylums. Uh, he was good friends with John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, who was his pastor. And for many years, he struggled with, why would God allow this to happen in my life? Why would God let me labor so under this affliction? And he wrote a number of beautiful poems, which became hymns, one of which is um, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Have you ever heard it? I'm just quoting a bunch of obscure hymns tonight. I'm sorry. I like them. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. Trust not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Friend, when you get to heaven, when you cross the river death and enter into the celestial city, what will you want to look back on? Will you want to look back on a life of worry, a life of fretting, a life of clawing, scraping against this 
hard knuckle world? Or will you want to look back and see that Jesus has carried you through every season and that you have rested in his arms? Such that when you arrive and are greeted by him in glory, every glorious victory that he has wrought in your life, you get to lay it right back down at his feet. The righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. God, we bring nothing to the table. We look at this world around us and our hearts are broken. We mourn and we lament and we are even angry at the sin and wickedness that seems to prevail. And yet it only seems so. We know, Father, that you are in control of all things and that you are bringing all of them to the bright design of your perfect end. And so we trust you and wait. I pray for my dear friends here who are suffering long, who have felt the sting of the thorn, the curse of this world and the evil that yet inhabits. I pray that you would be merciful to them. Give them eyes to see how good it is to wait. Even when it seems slow, help them to wait with great patience for that final day to come. And on that day, O God, redeem every last iniquity, every last tear and lash, God, bring it to its fruition such that we may declare on that day you have done all things well. Keep us and hold us until that final day, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.